Everybody's here. Yep. Jacques Derrida. All right, everybody say hi to the Rons. Hello, What's patrons. Up? Hey, patrons. Um, as you know, I took the responsibility of picking the topic for this week, which I immediately passed on to the patrons, which I think is a good idea. They came up with a lot of good ideas. Yeah, I like the Rawls idea. I was sad that one didn't win. What was it again? Um, this is A and J. They want us, or yeah, this is actually two people, so I can say they uh, got a, the correct pronouns. They wanted us to debate and compare your guys' thing, which is the Rawls stuff, with uh, the Delari stuff, the micropolitics. Oh, like like Delizian and uh, Delizian Guitari politics versus Rawls politics. Yeah, so I think libs That'd versus be interesting. libs versus non libs. Libs that versus would be incoherent that. radicals. <laughs> Excuse me. Shots Excuse fired already. Me? Oh, um, don't worry. We... One, yeah, I was gonna say you guys can become fucking vegetable all that you want. I'll fucking happily take a set of principles and rights any day. Yeah, yeah go live live in the margin of like nothingness of like a poor a poric nothingness if that's even a word. Yeah, distribute How about the margins of philosophy. Yeah, just give everyone resources and that'll be great. Distributive justice. There is no race. There's no like, gender. At uh, least at least we understand what the hell it means. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that would have been fun as you can see. That would be fun, yeah. <laughs> One of the the second most liked one was uh, from Gennadios who says talk about existentialism. That'd be good. I would enjoy that'd be that. good. We could do Kierkegaard to Nietzsche. No, we should start with Augustine for existential. Well, we should do. We should do Sartre, though, man. I mean, come on. Uh, well, of course, I'd be included. Yeah. Um, the one that won the vote is from Matt H. Oh yeah. Uh, semiotics. Dot. 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 Or Derrida? Question mark. Okay. <laughs> so pretty open ended. Very um, oh, this is one of my favorite patron names. Apples to apples, dust to dust. Oh, that's good. <laughs> that is uh, he or she wanted us to do Baudrillard on the pod. That'd be fun. Yeah, that'd be cool. Uh, and I think pre pre 1981 Baudrillard, because I always talk about post 1980 Baudrillard. Oh, some interesting suggestion, suggestions. Prophet Overlord said uh, Marshall McLuhan. We haven't even yeah. brought him up, I don't think. Yeah. So. I think are, we in a, cool. are we in a hot medium right now? Is this is podcasting a hot or a cold? It's super <laughs> hot. It's only auditory. Oh. Yeah. Plus, he is the sage of Toronto, and we are the, the new sages of Didn't Toronto. Did he teach at York for a while? I remember somebody telling me that. Um, U of T. U of T. T. Well, I know he was at U of T, but I heard he had a class at York. Anyway, it doesn't matter. He might have had a, a class at York, but like U of T even has like a center. They have like a center named after him, like the Marshall McLuhan Center of yeah. like Communication Studies or something. Yeah, he's a homegrown hero. And his teacher, hero. Harold Innes, also has a building down the road on Philosopher's Walk, yeah, as and we his, call and it. And his college, too. One of the colleges of U of T is, uh, is named after him, too. Yeah, that would be fun to do him. Yeah. Yeah. We talk I, about I, how we're happy. all in tribal space of simultaneity nowadays. Yo, what's that? Cro I think it's a Cronenberg movie. It's like set in Toronto. Um, James Woods oh, is in it. Videodrome. And it's very McLuhan-esque. Oh, yeah. Literally, like, this weird McLuhan figure has videotapes that he gives the protagonist. They're talking to him. Even though he's supposed to be dead, it's pretty fucked up. Oh, and the TV has sex with him. That was pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. It'd be cool to do the older Cronenbergs. Yeah, up to Existence. His newer stuff is a little more commercial. I have to say, I'm kind of upset that like I've never had a TV that actually like reached out to try to like fillet me. I mean, yeah. I would probably buy that just for the one-time experience, but we haven't gotten there yet. We should Body ask horror. the question: What is Canadian philosophy? One day. <laughs> yeah, the Toronto School. We like to represent. <laughs> Because some of so many of our exports are awful, awful humans. Lauren Southern, <laughs> Jordan the JP, Stefan Molyneux. I'm doing my best to not bring him up every single day, but <laughs> <laughs> he's, well, he's back, back though. Now. He's back in the mix. That, right? He's back in health. He's ready for more punches from the bottom of the podcast barrel. God, he's so emotional too. Like it's it's interesting to watch. Like I watched his recent video, and he's just. Like that's not a bad thing or anything, right? Like I'm not, obviously being emotional is fine. It's just I find it like a striking feature of his personality that that like everything hits him so hard and deep. You can tell, like you know, you can yeah. tell when he's talking about something, he'll choke up. It's like 
But then his it's image is like being this emotional. stolid guy with his shoulders back and a clean dick and a tight room. It's because room. he sees the, it's because he feels the <laughs> profundity and the and the terribleness of the, or the the dread of human existence so deep in his soul that it can't help but overwhelm him. He's a he's a hard man with a mushy center. All right, since we're already bringing him up, I was not going to do this, but I will ask because he has a lot to say about Derrida, having very evidently never it's read him. It's a good him. way. And the collapse of Western civilization and all that stuff. So I was going to start with this anyway, but now we can connect it to um, his takes and maybe people around him. Uh, if you guys watch more awful YouTube than I do, you know I do. What do you people? What do you hear about when people are referencing Derrida in passing, including the terms deconstruction and postmodernism? Well, uh, the just one like, thing that, oh, sorry, go ahead, Victor. Well, I was just going to say, I mean, the typical like caricature, right, comes from, I guess, like the analytic school, right, as just being incoherent makes no sense. Like those are the typical critiques. Like it's all like flourish and no content, right? It's like uh, language, uh, playing with language for fun without like actually saying anything. I don't know. That's like the typical, typical and Searle, responses. Searle threw a chair at Derrida. Apparently. I kept searching it for that and I couldn't I couldn't find it. But well I, maybe it's part of academic lore. I always but. pictured Deleuze sitting in the room and then he would say that this is the moment where Derrida was becoming chair. And so he'd <laughs> end up with Cherida. Also, <laughs> Derrida's hot, hey? Yeah, he he's a he's a man. he's got the smoldering look. He's always like he's always got this face slightly down, slightly turned, but with that sort of Duck smoldering lips. eyes and the shock of silver hair he's striking yeah. he's a striking chap isn't he from yeah. he's isn't he jewish from like uh algeria or is yeah. he's algerian <laughs> yeah he's yep. french algerian he's always been kind of but not jewish orders. right yeah he's jewish oh jewish algerian yeah he's got he's he's interesting if you're born in algeria did you get french citizenship automatically yeah, you know anything they about actually that? considered it part of the French homeland for a little while, which is one of the reasons they fought so hard to keep it in the empire, even though, you know, a lot of Algerians that, that by the 1950s were like, get the fuck out, bye. Great film on that, The Battle for Algiers, mm -hmm. French film. Yeah, mm -hmm. Derrida is the guy who's associated probably most strongly with the idea that there is no objective truth no reality yeah. that everything is kind of in flux and also the progenitor of critical theory i guess he's just smashed in with there which Derrida does does talk about critique all the time but i wouldn't even call him a postmodernist yeah yeah i mean he's a post structuralist that would be the proper word for it like postmodernism came around like a little bit later with with Leotard taking the term out of architecture and applying it in a more general sense to like modern culture. Yeah, and I guess so, Derrida is associated with like being skeptical of truth, but but like I mean, by the time he came around to talk about it, that was a pretty old idea, right? Like I mean, with Nietzsche and other people. Yeah, and he, he brings up Nietzsche and Heidegger and Freud quite a bit. I think that's some actually of the stuff one of the, I was going over. Anti-foundationalism, you might say. I'd say that's one of the more the one of the objections that you see from more sophisticated analytical critics, uh, or I should say, like equally dismissive but nor knowing analytical critics. Right? Uh, Martha Nussbaum wrote an essay on Derrida, uh, well, not an essay on Derrida, where she was talking just generally about French philosophy, and she more or less said that she felt that everything that Derrida had said had been said uh, more readily, more profoundly, uh, and more clearly, prior, maybe? Uh, prior to Derrida's writings by Wittgenstein, right? Um, Interesting. So our basic point is, you know, why bother reading Derrida when you can just go read the philosophical investigations and you'll get a lot more out of it. Uh, and it'll also be considerably easier than going through of grammatology. That's an interesting well, claim. Yeah, yeah, I mean, like that's, that's really not a true claim, but it's interesting. Yeah, I mean, if you yeah, if you sure. want to claim that like the cash outs are the same with what they're saying, you can. But you can't claim that their like trajectory and their background is the same. Like it's very different in that sense. Derrida assumes a whole different sort of background of knowledge. He's one of those guys. He's really hard to read because you got to know a lot about philosophy and metaphysics and history yeah. he's a lot like heidegger in that sense you have to have a pretty strong grasp already of the tradition and then you got to get into that tradition and sort of critique it from within using its own terms uh, yeah. so people just dismiss him from the outside without knowing anything about what he's talking about 
I mean, that's your prerogative, I guess, but don't pretend that you're giving a fair assessment. I also think that like, um, if you look at like the cash out of Wittgensteinian analysis, uh, while it is highly skeptical in some senses, his own interpretation uh, of his work is considerably more conservative, not politically, uh, but in terms of its radicalness for um, the way it is that language operates, because he more or less says that once you've completed a philosophical analysis, you realize, frankly, that there's really no point to this because everyday language operates just fine uh, without the need for these kinds yeah. of reflective activities. And so philosophers can really only just leave things as they were uh, in the famous expression, right? Uh, and that they only seem more, weird because... And they only seem weird because you ask weird questions. Like that's what lang an analysis of language, a Wittgensteinian analysis will show is that like when you start asking like what is truth or like what is meaning, that like because that's taking it out of the ordinary use of the word, mm -hmm. that like it becomes weird when actually in your everyday life it's not weird at all because it plays a pragmatic form of life purpose. And this uh, this critique that you offered, Matt, that, that this <laughs> is – or that – what, what's her name? Martha no, no, Nussbaum. It's, it's not a critique. Nussbaum's point is essentially that, in her mind at least, everything Derrida said had been said earlier and better and clearer by Ludwig Wittgenstein. Right. The, the main Nussbaum. thing that – the main contention I have with that point is that Wittgenstein does not include historical analysis of language and how language comes to mean. He more talks about the everyday – Whereas Derrida is very concerned with, you know, the history of philosophy and discourse theory. Yeah, no, I, I would agree with that. But I mean, this guy goes to my point about how Wittgenstein has a bit more of a conservative approach to language, right? Because to his mind, the kind of settled practices uh, of ordinary language, uh, what he calls language games in certain contexts, function perfectly fine without philosophical reflection. Uh, and so you're kind of cured of this need to do theory and you enter back into everyday life from a more reflective standpoint. Uh, but without feeling compelled to interrogate the world uh, in the way a philosopher traditionally would. And I'm sure that Eric will point this out also. I don't think that that's Derrida's point at all, right? Because one of the things that he showcases, and I think this is what he draws from Heidegger, is that if you look at the history of philosophical thought and the impact that it's had uh, on particularly Western or Occidental conceptions of more or less everything, uh, there's this immense deconstructive task we have ahead of ourselves to try to show how it is that certain kinds of presence have been privileged over others. Uh, and so the job of the philosopher is much more radical uh, than this kind of coming to grips with everyday life that you see in Wittgenstein's analysis. <clears throat> kind, of an kind of an aside, but I, I had an analytic uh, philosophy professor when I was doing my master's in philosophy, and he like showed me this book that looked really interesting, and I always wanted to like go and read it. And it was, it was basically arguing that, do you guys know who Donald Davidson is? He's like a super yeah. analytic philosopher. Yeah. How like Donald Davidson and Derrida are like come to the exact same conclusions, basically. They and, do like, about metaphors. Yeah, and like I mean, other not things. The, and, like, not the, the exact same conclusion, but they're they're definitely in the same ballpark. Well, this is one of the reasons why I always got angry that analytical philosophers criticized him so much because I was like, if you look at the consequences of the linguistic turn uh, in people like Wittgenstein, or for that matter, in people like Quine, or for that, or in people like Rorty. And Rorty a lot of name dropping others. happening here, bro. Yeah, a lot of name dropping. Well, here, sorry, these were just, <laughs> in some, these were all analytical philosophers of language and logic who more or less came to the conclusion that we can't, we have to drop this idea that language paints a picture, if you want, of how the world operates. Uh, it's a lot more complicated than that. Uh, and since we can't say that language creates a picture of how the world operates, or for that matter, how the mind operates, we have to drop the idea that our knowledge can ever have the kind of certainty uh, that a lot of philosophers have wanted it to have, right? And that's a very Derridean idea. I mean, Derrida would cash this out very differently. But. The interesting thing about Davidson, though, is, and I know we're name dropping a lot, but like, I th what the thing that's interesting about about that is that like he never read any like continental philosophy really. Like he wasn't, mm -hmm. he just like kind of independently arrived at some of those uh, compatible conclusions, mm -hmm. even though whereas like Rorty, right, was somebody who did end up reading a lot of continental philosophy, and yeah. I think that was what partly changed his mind. Yeah, I remember actually Rorty had a, a very famous uh, query, I think it was in the early 1980s, when somebody came up to him, uh, I was a continental philosopher, and said, you know, I'm really surprised that an analytical philosopher like you would have this weird history of how philosophy operates, because it sounds a lot like Martin Heidegger's, uh, and Rorty said, well, that's who I got it from. And this mm -hmm. guy was shocked, just blown away, because he was like, you read Martin Heidegger, and Rorty was like, oh yeah, all the time. And, this was right before I became a lot more overt about this in the 1980s, writing about how yeah. and Derrida and Foucault and all of them. Anyway, <clears throat> maybe you guys should, or maybe um, we should talk more about Derrida, even though I don't know. Uh, yeah, maybe at all. 
It would be good. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, yeah. I wrote a paragraph, actually, and I'm just going to diatribe it. But it's okay, intended good. to get anyone who's not up to speed. Um, don't worry about all these names. We're, it's an analytic versus continental thing. Yeah, um, we're just rambling. But I wrote, a, I wrote a paragraph on what deconstruction is because that's the term most associated and feared when it comes mm -hmm. to Derrida. So think of it this way. We're used to thinking of things as self-identical. That means obviously that A equals A, the ball is a ball, and fine, those things are okay. Um, what deconstruction gets, or what Derrida notices and gets worried about is when we think of self-identical terms in the sense of giant concepts, historical Western philosophy grounding concepts like truth, knowledge, or nature. And this is, culture. this is where Derrida's problem comes in and why he reads things deconstructively. Um, because these terms are historically situated. And then today uh, in, in state philosophy or what Deleuze would call state philosophy, it's used to justify all manner of hierarchies of knowledge, archaeologies of knowledge, we might say, and status quo. So what he's doing when the, the projects of the 60s and 70s for Derrida are almost the same for every book. It, he just takes a different thinker. Um, Hegel is the, the gloss book, um, Rousseau in grammatology, and he reads them and he finds these, these pivot points, you could call them like the pillars of their systems and says like this pillar is grounding the entire structure of this giant philosophical system. But this pillar isn't exactly what it looks like. There's actually something else holding this pillar up that's outside the system that they're forgetting. So they're assuming a presence that isn't there. Sorry, I'm almost done. Um, and then we get to the concept of ghosts and spectras and <laughs> supplements and traces. So when we have traces and ghosts, what are these things? They're not full things, but they're an indication that something's missing from the system. They're a half thing, like a ghost is a half person or not a real person. Same with a trace. It reveals that there was something here that is no longer here. Um, this is where he gets into the concept of metaphoricity, that our concepts like knowledge, truth, nature, are actually based on metaphors that we have forgotten our metaphors. So um, these are absences, they're indications of absences. So for Derrida to get over Hegel, and that's kind of the project, same as Deleuze, but he does it in a different way, get over Hegel, more or less. We have to find the ghosts, we have to find what has been repressed, and we have to find those things that have been banished from official philosophy or official Western knowledge and science, and then bring those things back. So thank you guys for permitting me to diatribe. I think if you want to point to any of those things and say that I'm incorrect or give examples, uh, that would be a good way to start, I think. Yeah, yeah. I think another, another good way to just begin what talking about what Derrida is up to is to say he's 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 almost taking over also this project that that Heidegger put in motion this critique of Western metaphysics going all the way back to Plato and even further to the Sophists and the pre-Socratics before him. So Derrida takes over this sort of critique, and when you're talking about him finding those those lacks, those exclusions, those things that ground knowledge. He's, he's also thinking about the way that Western metaphysics is predicated, predicates knowledge on certain things like the idea of a center organizing the whole entire structure of knowledge or the idea of speech being more important than writing and writing just being a derivative form of speech and also being constitutive of science. So he's taking off over this critique of like 2,000 years of Western metaphysics, uh, and that's where his historical understanding, so when he's talking about history, it's usually the history of Western metaphysics, philosophy, and science. And he is trying to get into that tradition and sort of use it on its own terms to critique it. And he does this, for instance, if you read Structure, Sign, and Play, that's like his first sort of major essay 
or well, it's a talk he gives at John Hopkins in 1967, I believe. So the whole story is kind of funny because structuralism has come into France in a big way in the 60s. And it's almost like this conference was where the French structuralist Claude Levi Strauss was going to be kind of I guess you could say crowned king of structuralism. <laughs> and, <laughs> and and then Derrida, and the, like, so structuralism's barely been around for very long. It kind of took this weird route from Ferdinand de Saussure through all these linguistic circles to France, and then structuralism became big. And then almost immediately Derrida shows up on the scene and kind of just throws a wrench with this with this essay, really, into the whole thing. And the essay gets right into it to say that the concept of structure, if something has happened, let's call it an event. Mm. And no one knows, uh, by the way, that's a great intro. If you don't know Derrida, never read him. Um, structure, Shine, and Play is great. But nobody knows who this guy is. So Levi Strauss is being celebrated. Um, this is 1966. And Derrida... Nobody knows who he is yet. In 1967, he publishes three massive books. So, Grammatology, Writing Indifference, and I can't remember the third one. Was it the Husserl book on um, uh, voice and phenomena? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. Speech and phenomena. So, he, he drops three books after showing up unknown and, like, basically dissing, dissing structuralism. Yeah, and the three big books would probably, you could say, the like, focus on Rousseau, one of them focuses on Husserl, and one of them maybe focuses on, I don't know, Plato and Saussure and a couple other people as well. Well, I wanted to cash this out actually um, in two different ways uh, to kind of bring to light uh, the political implications of this. Um, and one of them is how feminists have interpreted Derrida, feminist Derridians, I should say, and the other is how post-colonial theory uh, has interpreted mm. Derrida, since he's had a big influence on both, for better or worse, uh, depending on who you ask, right? Um, but one of the things that, you know, as Eric pointed out, I think was innovative about Derrida's uh, analysis is how he talks about how what is repressed uh, or what is marginalized nonetheless always still exists in a certain relation to what's put forward, right? Uh, and in fact, what's put forward as being better or more real uh, or morally superior is in many senses dependent uh, upon what's being repressed. Uh, and one example post-colonial theorists give and we brought up uh, Said a little while ago, is that it depended on this notion, uh, this notion of Western civilization uh, on its other, uh, in this case, usually the East, right? Uh, and people like Gayatri Spivak, who wrote the introduction to algorithmology for in, uh, English audiences, made this point expressly, right? <laughs> and translated the whole thing. Yeah, exactly. Um, so we have this notion of the so-called Western world, right? Uh, but if you actually ask people what it means to be Western, it's really difficult to pin that down. Right. Does it mean that, you know, you're a Christian nation? While well, there are Christian nations in Africa, Latin America, we don't consider them part of the West. Right. Does it mean you're beholden to enlightenment values? Well, Japan is beholden to enlightenment values. You can make the argument that China is beholden in many ways to enlightenment values. We don't consider them part of the West. Right. Uh, does it mean that you're committed to Greco-Roman civilization? Well, you know, Greco-Roman civilization had a tremendous impact in Egypt, the Hellenistic world, all the way to India. Right. Uh, and so the idea that Spivak gives up is what is meant by the West is usually just defined by its opposite. And typically um, this conception of the East as being more barbaric, more effeminate, uh, more dedicated to unreason and so on. Uh, and it's always through this process of juxtaposition that the so-called Western world has been able to define itself. And unless it had this available, it wouldn't have been able to do this for a very long period of time. Right, uh, and we continue to do this to this day, uh, as Spivak would say. Right. Uh, the other point that I want to bring up. Wait, can we reflect on that for a second? Well, I, I just want to bring up the one other example because it's it's a really similar one, and it's something that I've been thinking about more recently. Yeah, well, you can bring it up in a second, but okay, I just go ahead. Yeah, like go ahead. Jordan Peterson in his defense of Western civilization is very correct to identify Derrida as an enemy. Mm. I think we should, uh, Derrida, excuse me. Uh, I don't think he is an enemy of Western civilization per se. I think he would say I mean, that actually the whole point that he's trying to make is that we shouldn't necessarily even think about things in terms of Western civilization. And if we do, we have to recognize precisely this ex how this exclusionary method is constitutive uh, of our entire conception of ourselves as Westerners. But, yeah, I mean, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm okay with the implication that he had some kind of malicious intent towards the yeah. West, though. It's no, almost like as if he's trying to show us a better way of doing things. Yeah. Isn't that why any philosopher does what they do? Is because they're 
showing us something that we can. Uh, I meant, uh, I meant the point is the West Western civilization doesn't exist for, for the reasons exactly. that Matt just said. Yeah. It's a, it's a complete uh, okay. fabrication. Yeah. So, so ethno ethnography doesn't exist because anthropologists just go out into the field and that's also the West. They go to, they go to Mick Africa and Mick Indonesia and they're already places part of the West because the West does, well, this, uh, I, I mean, I'm just joking, but there's, n there is, it's not a coincidence that he's going after an anthropologist <laughs> in this yeah. first 1967 essay. And he talks about ethnography and what is the condition behind ethnography? Well, just in a very loose way, it's, it's the West starting to introspect and starting to say, okay, well, what's not Western. Okay. Let's send our anthropologists out into the field to figure out what's not Western, so we can then get a better idea of ourselves. So it's like a project that comes along with self knowledge well, oh, yeah. of the West. I'm curious, like, so how would you would you make a distinction between like the West and Enlightenment values? Like, I think there is a difference, but like, I know obviously Jordan Peterson's talking about West, the West, but then there's also this idea of like Enlightenment rationalism or Enlightenment philosophy, which is often associated with Western philosophy as opposed to mm -hmm. like Eastern or other philosophy and like I guess my like brief take it's like something that actually came up when I was taking a Nietzsche seminar like we were t we were asking whether like Nietzsche is in what is he a break with like enlightenment uh like like rationality and like to like the the consensus at least in that seminar was like not really like in some ways like like Nietzsche is a radicalization of of enlightenment rationalism it's like pushing rationalism to its like furthest limits and there's like so I don't know I wonder if uh you guys think like how, like how if that changes the question or changes the answer at all to ask it from the perspective. Of I, I think it's important to note that this doesn't necessarily have to be, as Eric would put it, a, a hostile uh, way of analyzing things, right? I mean, in the Husserl book, he makes that clear also, right? When it comes to you determining your own subjectivity, uh, he's pushes against Husserl's idea that you can have immediate access to some kind of ego conception. And the reason is that in many ways, we conceive of ourselves by in relation to others who were not. Right. Like I sit there and I think to myself, like, well, who is Matt? Right. Well, Matt is unlike Victor because Matt is doesn't have family from Chile. Matt, you know, doesn't have dark hair. Matt, you know, isn't interested in the same things. And so it's through this process of distinguishing myself from you that I can sometimes better understand myself. And there's nothing wrong with that. Right. You know, this is something that we all do and it's necessary to develop a conception of the self. Uh, but we can't pull ourselves into a conception of ourself purely subjectively. It's always in relation to some kind of other, right? And I think you would say the same thing is true about civilizations or nations or religious groups or whatever, right? Sometimes this can be problematic if it's politically misused or used to justify various forms of marginalization, right? But it doesn't have to yeah, be. Yeah, like Western, Western metaphysics is the bigger historical frame here. So the Enlightenment is part of that history. And the Romantics after that were working with the concepts handed down to them. So you're always working in this tradition. You're either working for it or working against it, but you can't escape it. There's no sort of cavalier way to just step outside of it and say, ah, I'm free of all of this stuff now, or I'm, I'm not doing philosophy anymore. Because normally when you just try to do that in some cavalier kind of dismissive way, you just end up stepping fully into metaphysics. And then you're not examining any of your preconceptions. You're just you're just doing bad philosophy is what he says. That's usually just what happens. You just do bad philosophy. What we got to do is get into the tradition. We got to read the tradition critically. And we got to see when you guys are talking about like the centers and the groundings, I also like to talk about the constitutive exclusions. So what needs to be swept aside in order to establish the tradition? What goes to the peripheries and the margins? What gets excluded from the center? And that's what – that's – that's the basic thing. So you're always – the Enlightenment is part of the tradition of Western metaphysics, as is the Romantic reaction, as is Nietzsche, Freud, and Heidegger, who are also working in that tradition with concepts they inherit from the same And isn't it also Derrida in some ways or no? Yeah. Yeah. He, exactly. he outright says, yeah, he's not working – he's working in the same tradition as well. Exactly. And he's – he just – he sees in people like Heidegger and Nietzsche and Freud – a more sustained critique of the ideas of Western metaphysics. Obviously, he thinks they didn't even take it far enough, but he sees in them the most sustained critiques of things like 
say, what are the conditions of objective truth or transcendental philosophy and all these other, all these other concepts. There's a big list of them that he has that, that Western metaphysics gets along with. So concepts like substance, existence, essence, presence, subjectivity, aletheia, which is truth, transcendentalism, consciousness, conscience in the moral sense, God, and man. So, for instance, in the Middle Ages, right, the transcendental signifier, what we'd call that sort of organizing center of all knowledge at that point was God. And then when we get into the Enlightenment tradition, God is removed. And what's put in its place? Human reason. So reason becomes the sort of center organizing that phase of Western metaphysics, if you want to call it that. And then after that, the argument goes, one of the biggest critiques I've heard of Derrida is all Derrida does is he takes man and reason out of the picture and just sort of puts language in the center, which in a way he does, but he does it in a very sort of critical and self-conscious way that allows us to sort of see this history of Western metaphysics that he's talking about and ways in which we can get at the sort of presumptions, the truths, the the... I don't know what you'd call them, the, uh, the, the uncritical concepts that they use, the, the concepts are not self-critical. Yeah, and the kind of ironic thing, uh, and I'll just bring it back to the point you made about Peterson's interpretation and others like him when it comes to Derrida, because a lot of, uh, a figure that a lot of right-wingers happen to like, Heidegger, right, I think actually had a much more damning account of the history of Western metaphysics in some of his periods than Derrida does for all the reasons Eric was talking about, right? I mean, if you read some of the uh, Heidegger stuff in the 1930s, even upwards to the 1940s, there's the sense that the end of Western metaphysics has been a nihilistic, technocratic, uh, increasingly deracinated world. Uh, and that's why we need to end philosophy, sometimes very expressed about that, uh, and start trying to move towards what he calls thinking. Uh, you know, this kind of originary act of thinking again. And I don't think Derrida ever says anything like that. Uh, he sometimes says that all I'm trying to do is allow us, uh, and he uses the term, I think, uh, quite literally, uh, at least as literally as Derrida ever does, you know, I'm trying to let you play with the history that you have available to you, not by saying that you should reject it, but by loosening it up and, as Eric was saying, showing you the different elements and the different weird sides uh, to the history of Western metaphysics that people have marginalized. Uh, and this doesn't mean that I'm saying we can't, we'll have to do without a center or that we've entered in some kind of apocalyptic time. It just means that we should look at this uh, as a set of tools to use in interesting and creative ways rather than uh, as a set of firm concepts that must be applied to the world in this way in order to give us an accurate picture of it, uh, regardless of the discipline you happen to be in. Yeah, so you can probably summarize a lot of what Derrida is looking at, like two of the biggest concepts maybe that he's working with are the idea of origins and the idea of universality, making universal claims. So you can think if you're looking at a work that is either obsessed with origins or universality, you're probably dealing with some kind of uncritical Western metaphysician who isn't examining these concepts. And that's exactly what he wants to do in structure, sign, and play because structures have origins he talks about, for instance, the origin of language. And things have claims to universality, right? So when we talk about nature, we're talking about universal and spontaneous, as opposed to culture, which is particular and differs from structure to structure. Every culture has its own structure, so there's difference between them. So he's, he's, he's trying to get underneath these concepts of origin and universality and particular and general and... Just that for lack, I guess you say deconstruct them. Look at what are their, what are the main binaries going on here? Like male, female, nature, culture, universal, particular, all of these sorts of binaries that we just sort of take for granted that structure different areas of knowledge. Speech and text. Speech and writing. Yeah. Yeah, speech and writing, speech and text. Yeah, all these things. He's trying to get underneath them by saying that they are part of this Western metaphysical tradition. But he's not trying to get underneath them. He's trying to show that the, well, I guess, they were, we're, we're using metaphors, right? Like under, under closer scrutiny. Right. Yeah, under closer scrutiny, they do not hold up to analysis in a certain, in a very specific 
sense. They, the, you see that the two terms of the binary are actually dependent on one another. And that's a sign that there's something going on there that needs to be made explicit. I wanted to ask what we think here about one of the most quoted and most uh, derided comments that Derrida has made. I believe it's from Grammatology. There is nothing outside the text. And this is usually mm. taken as an indication of Derrida's nihilism. Um, mm. And it isn't. And I'll throw it to you after. But yeah, we're talking about what, when, when Eric is saying universality plus this um, obsession with origin, what's really being emphasized and what's emphasized throughout Western philosophy, um, Plato and his Eidos or Aristotle and his Uzia, and we can take it all the way to Heidegger's being, is they're obsessed with what's the presence, what's the opaqueness that you can basically believe in and trust to uh, give you an accurate presentation of the world. Um, and then saying there's nothing outside the text is saying that we can't get to those things because there's nothing out there. So would you take this as a evidence of his nihilism and why not? Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. I, I would say the, the, the passage is already translated problematically. Like there is no out, Sinapa dos text. Il n'y a pas hors text. Yeah. There is no outside text. Uh, it's it's hyphenated outside text. If you want to translate it a little more, uh, like faithfully, uh, but like there there is nothing outside of the text implies that there's a text and there's an outside of that text. And Derrida is saying that there's nothing outside of the text. Well, no, that's part of the mistranslation reading. Mm. He's saying there is no outside text. There is no point you can get to outside of the structure of the text that you're reading that the truth will just reveal itself from that position. So an outside text would be something like God, again, to bring it up again. God is outside of the text in, in the bad reading. So God is – this is where the scientists want to get to too with their uh, sort of pure objective perspective. They get outside of the text and they look – into the text and they can just sort of determine all of the truths about the text by just well, what looking. is the text why don't we st why don't we establish that yeah so yeah, is it, how is this like kind of the similar point to like the, the idea of there being no archimedean point of reference yeah yeah, that, yeah that's another way to put it archimedean yeah the archimedean lever or point yeah yeah the, the way i've interpreted uh, and this might be a little bit too beholden to Rorty's interpretation of Derrida with the reference to the Archimedean point that Victor just made there. Uh, I should say first off that I think that some of the materialist criticisms of Derrida actually hold here because I do think that there is a residual linguistic idealism that you can find in Derrida, much like you can see a kind of residual idealism in Heidegger's work. Uh, and so I agree with Gigi's critique of Derrida in that respect, uh, along with like Fred Jameson's and others, right? Uh, but I do think that this point has been misunderstood uh, in exactly the way that Eric talked about, right? Which is essentially that there's nothing outside of language or there's nothing outside of the words that we used. And that's pretty nonsensical. Uh, mm -hmm. The way that I understand this is just that there's no pre-interpretive standpoint uh, you can take when it comes to the world that's foundational uh, and that kind of determines everything else, right? Things are interpreted the whole mm -hmm. way down, right? Uh, and so yeah. when we think about knowledge, it's better to look at it uh, in terms of Almost not quite a circle, but free flowing kinds of interpretation, right? Rather than this kind of way of looking at the world is built upon this kind of way and this kind of way, and then we get to the rock bottom. Uh, and that's where we stop and we say we've reached at least as close to absolute certainty as we're ever going to get, right? Uh, yeah. I think this is the idea of play that he brings up here also, right? Uh, that rather than looking for a foundation uh, and saying that everything's kind of hierarchically built on that, we just say, uh, where there's free flows of interpretation and there's different ways of looking at things. Uh, and it doesn't mean that there's not better ways of looking at things or worse ways of looking at things, uh, but there's no foundationless way uh, of looking at things that determines everything else. Yeah, there's no, there's only text outside of text, mm -hmm. maybe is like the positive way to put it. Mm -hmm. Like if you, like just as a really practical example, 
Like you read a poem and you want the meaning of the poem now. So you have various strategies you can employ. And if you believe that there's an outside of the text, then you might believe something that, well, I can get to the meaning of this poem by appealing to the author's intention because the author is outside of the text. So his intention must be the thing that points to the meaning of the text. Or you go into the author's life. You do the biographical reading. So you say, okay, so he was uh, abused as a child. So this is what this means at this part of the poem. And then he grew up and like his wife got sick and died. So this is what this means at this point of the poem. So his point is, no, you're, what you're doing is you're just translating one text using another text. You're not getting outside the text and getting to the fundamental meaning of it. You're just using one text to translate another text. So it's fine to go and use the author's intention as something that guides your interpretation of the text, but don't pretend you're getting outside of the text to some kind of transcendental truth using that method. That's probably a really practical way of expressing what it means, or like, you know, what's the meaning of life? Okay, let's go read the Bible, because that's got the meaning of life in it, because God wrote that text, and God is outside the system, so we just need to look at what God meant to say. Or, yeah, so th th those are the sorts of, like, when you interpret, you're always bringing one text to another text. There's no getting outside of the text. In like, text is sort of, in this sense, he's, he's very critical, but it's a totalizing kind of thing. Like, everything is text. Can yeah. I ask a question? Is a if we can text. go, uh, sorry, what was your question, Victor? Is it related to that? It is related to that. And, like, it's, it's, it's just kind of, like, I don't know Derrida well, but I was just curious, like, how, like, this sounds... Like, is this a different point than kind of like the phenomenological point, like, or which maybe is like kind of like an idealist point, I guess, in some ways, but it's a bit different, like that, like from a, from a phenomenological perspective, at least, like you can't ever like get outside of like yourself, like your, like your perception of the world is always contaminated by you being an embodied being in a specific circumstance. So there's no point at which outside of that, that you could look at yourself looking at the world and then give like an objective, I don't know, is that related, different? How is that different? Well, this is actually what I wanted yeah, so to bring the, up the, with the critique of Husserl that he makes, right? Because one of the, the, the points that he makes, and I actually think Wittgenstein makes this point as well, right? Is that uh, the transcendental tradition had this idea that what's foundational uh, to all of our understanding is the suggestive, uh, like the subjective self uh, and its cognition, right? And so if you ask yourself like, well, who am I? Putting it really basically, you'd say, well, I am my thoughts. You know, my stream of consciousness, if you wanted to use the nodernist terminology, right? And so all I need to do is listen to what it is that I'm saying, and that voice in Matt's head is who Matt is, foundationally, right? Uh, and Derrida would say, it's absolutely fine to think of yourself as a stream of consciousness in some respects, but think about, you know, where you inherited this language from, right? You didn't invent it yourself. You got it from interacting with other people around you. You got it from reading books. You got it from hosting podcasts, talking about Derrida. So when your stream of consciousness is saying things like Derrida said this and that, it's because you were interacting with other kinds of texts, right? Uh, I want to so, be clear here, though. Derrida does not talk in phenomenological terms. He's not saying, here's you and here's, like, here's your sense well, this, of self. This is what I'm criticizing. Well, this is like how he would critique phenomena. Yeah, this is what he's criticizing, right? And Wittgenstein does the same point where he says there's no such thing as a private language or for that matter, a private self, right? Because we need to inherit our ways of thinking about uh, ourselves uh, from the world outside of us and its languages uh, and its texts and its cultures, right? Uh, and so it's perfectly fine in some, some context to say who I am is my stream of consciousness, the kind of line of thought that's running through me. Uh, but that's not where interpretation ends, because then, of course, you could say, well, what language have you inherited? What's its culture? What's its gestation? What books have you region? Where's your education come from? So you think about the world in these kinds of terms. Uh, and so we move on to interpreting things that way, right? Uh, there's no foundational yeah. point where I say who I am is my subjective stream of consciousness uh, and the words yeah, that that's, are going through that's my Yeah, that's subject, yeah. Yeah, so phenomenology puts subject as the center right okay. or, or if okay. you're doing if you're if you're heidegger you're you're doing existential phenomenology so what heidegger says is is the, like if you if you start reading through heidegger and you want to get to the important ideas one of them is like dasein is that which takes yeah. a stand on its own being so existence becomes the center of that sort of phenomenal existential right i see what you're saying and like phenomenology did try to like escape the language of subjectivity right like merleau-ponty would have never said subject <laughs> he would have said like phenomenal field or like 
embodiment or something like that. But yeah, you're right. Like basically it's doing the same work. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Like, but the, yeah, the point is like with Heidegger and yeah, with people who take up the Heideggerian critique is that, you know, they, they expose the sorts of metaphysics or in Heidegger's language, onto theological assumptions of, of Western thought. Right. But yeah, they all, they, they're substituting one center for another. They're sent, they're, they're, they take a structure and they give it a new center. And this is why right at the opening, Derrida uses this term redoubling. He's like, okay, so instead of just giving you a new structure, I'm going to think about structure itself, the structurality of structure. What does it mean for there to be a structure? It means that the free play of language has to be contained. And what does that containing? <laughs> the center does that containing. And... At this point, it's really funny with the Matt's postmodern conservatism. One of the one of the quotes he puts in there is Rudy Giuliani saying, "The truth is not the truth." And if you read through Structure, Sign, and Play, the, here's my quote: "The center is not the center." <laughs> Derrida says this: "The center is not the center because because but for Derrida." The center is at the same time outside of the structure governing it from the outside. This is the outside text assumption again. So for classical thought about structures, you have to have this center, this origin, or this point of presence, right? Like presence comes from the Christian tradition, right? The, the second coming is the, the presence of God will eventually arrive. Or with Hegel, right? The presence of what? The phenomenology of spirit, so the presence of spirit. We're eventually going to get to this point of presence. So the, the center is at once the origin, the point outside that gives the structure its meaning, and it's the eschatology, the end point, what's going to come at the end. And he's critiquing all of these notions like in the same fell swoop of saying, okay, but let's think about structurality itself and the idea of centers. Is he is he eschewing though, like that he that he is positing some kind of center, like like how is he? He is. Wait, I can answer this question. Okay, because because I don't know Derrida. I really don't think okay. he is, because this is one of the critiques of Derrida. Same as so Heidegger critiques Nietzsche says, no, you're actually still being a Platonist. Derrida yeah. then says to Heidegger, no, actually you're still being a Platonist, yeah, and now exactly. people say, oh no, Derrida, you're actually still being a Platonist. Um, for a lot of reasons, we don't have to get into it. All. But everyone's like trying to kick the can further down the road. And by plainness, do you mean that there's like a hidden, there's like a hidden point of reference? Yeah, there's a right. hidden that the center's being like moved and then covered, over, moved. as it always is. Yeah. But Derrida does this a little bit different from Heidegger in the sense that he, or his later books after the sixties, the seventies books, are performative, which means the form matches the content. In that, he doesn't allow his own books to have centers, so he does things like having a book and then half of the book is written in a footnote and then half of the book is written like in a, in a margin, in the literal margin. And each of the texts is saying different things. And it's kind of like hacky. It's a little bit gimmicky. Yeah, and he only like did it. it once. He didn't try to like stick to a new writing style, but that's one form of, of doing it. Then he changes his vocabulary in every book. He uses different terms. You can use the arche, then he uses presence, then he uses supplement, then he uses every one of these terms to basically describe the same movement, but he's picking from all over philosophy to assemble this deviant text as a whole. So he keeps, he, he doesn't let himself become a systematic thinker in any part. And then later in his career, actually then he's writing about forgiveness and hospitality and the ghosts of Marx and all this stuff. So I think that you cannot take Derrida in the same way that you can take Heidegger as having a project. And by that, by virtue of that, he avoids the, oh, Derrida is just making everything language. Cause that's not true. I don't know. I mean, I don't know. This doesn't sound like that convincing to me. Like that just sounds stylistic when like, but you, you, you even just said, he, he uses different terms to describe the same movement. So there's a movement that he's working with. There's something that he's doing. Like, uh, yeah, but so, you but he's just using saying that it's the same. It. I mean, I said it's the same. I did, but like he's, he's this doing this second. by reading texts. He's not, he's okay, not, okay, he's okay. doing it performatively on each text. So first it's Rousseau, then it's Hegel, then it's, I mean, 
first it's Husserl, then okay, Rousseau, I see what you're saying. Yeah, I, I mean, I, 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 and, and again, I'm, really... I'm speaking from a place of zero authority as someone who's like maybe read like half of one of Derrida's books like once. So yeah, sorry, Pills made an interesting point, which is something really um, intriguing about the way. Uh, he goes about uh, engaging in philosophical reflection, right? Which is that unlike even Heidegger, who at least in being in time, more or less structured his book as a system. Uh, I think, Victor, you pointed this out uh, a little while ago, right? Like where he says, this is what my project is going to be. This is the terminology that I'm going to use. This is what all of it means. Here we go, right? Here are the three different ways that we apprehend time and so on. Derrida never really works this way. Uh, he doesn't even go as far as Wittgenstein does, which is to basically write uh, aphoristic paragraphs uh, on different points. Uh, he's always engaging with some other figure or set of figures and reading their text uh, and drawing out deconstructive uh, ideas and tropes uh, from his interpretation, right? Uh, but I can't think of a single Derrida book I've ever read where he's more or less, here's Jacques Derrida's thought uh, and Jacques Derrida's system. Uh, congratulations, you know, read this and you'll understand everything that I'm going through. Even of grammatology, which is usually considered as magnum opus, uh, as Eric pointed out, uh, most of the book is a reading of Saussure, reading uh, of Rousseau. Uh, and then if you look at Spectres of Marx, it's a reading of Marx. Uh, of Spirit, it's a reading of Heidegger. Lots of stuff interpreting uh, Husserl. Uh, and I think that's very much in the spirit of what Derrida is doing, right? Where he's saying, I'm not trying to put forward a new way that you should do things. What I'm doing is interpreting a text and trying to show you uh, both what the text says on its surface and all the stuff that is concealed or repressed beneath it. And this is why I am kind of like you guys Strauss in, Strauss in that way, even though they would hate that comparison. I do not think that anyone who says Derrida is obsessed with language or he's just moving the the onto theology onto language understands Derrida because the reason he's obsessed with language is because he says if we are to read, we must remain within the text. So if he's writing in a language and reading in a language in a philosophical tradition, there's nothing else that he could really talk about while remaining within the text. So he's literally doing the thing that he says is all you can do. And that's why it appears that he's obsessed with language until, of course, later then he's writing on uh, hospitality and forgiveness and things like this, where I think he's kind of tired of his project a little bit, being too linguistic. But I mean, that would be my rejoinder to uh, the accusation that he's too linguistic. Yeah, and like if the text is the history of Western metaphysics in like the broader sense, then then he says we don't have any language that's alien to this history. Everything yeah. we have comes from it, and it makes and it wouldn't make sense anyway to critique Western metaphysics without this language. All we have is the this these propositions that are already in the form, and he says the logic of precisely what it seeks to contest. So we only have the tools that we have inherited before in order to critique then the tradition that they come from. That's, th that's what he's sort of getting at with this language and this text thing. And another important thing to describe, so if you wanna get to what Derrida has to do with semiotics, right? So he's gonna talk about the way that language has been divided so you have spoken language and you have written language and from the beginning from aristotle on down to rousseau they say that spoken language is primary writing is derivative of spoken language right and he, he's attacking this as well because writing for him he wants to take it seriously and the reason that semiotics comes into play is because the sign, right? A sign is something that stands for something else that is not present. That's the whole idea. And presence is announced by speech, right? Because speech requires the presence of the speaker. And so he critiques this whole notion that, well, he calls it logocentrism. The, the center, the, using speech, spoken language and writing, phonetic writing, as it's sort of handmaiden, and semiotics comes into play because the sign is indicating something that's absent. A sign is always something that stands for something that's not there. And that's, even Saussure says this. He says, the sign is a sound pattern connected to a concept. And the written form of the sign is just derivative of this. The written form of the sign indicates the spoken word. And Derrida wants to explode this because on the one hand you have things like 
religion, which are based on the presence of speakers and ultimately the second coming, the second presence of God. And then you have science who says, okay, great. If, if writing is not bound to speech, then I can take writing and turn it into a purely sort of formal system of signs in order to describe the universe. So you have this sort of double tradition of science and philosophy that he's critiquing based on this distinction between spoken language and just writing. And that's why a lot of it, like writing and difference is the title of one of the major releases because he wants to sort of get back to writing and take play it taking writing seriously because writing, writing introduces difference. That's the and difference. Yeah, and that concept of difference. This is again performative because it's spelt. It, I mean, you can't see that it's a different word until you read it. So he's kind of undermining the superiority or supposed superiority of speech by saying, "Here's something that speech can't notice," which is quite a clever play. Yeah, there's certain differences. Yeah, there's certain differences that only appear in in writing. So when if you're a Frenchman. You have those two words, a and a, right? Is and and. And like, if you're not listening very carefully, they can sound the same. The difference actually only appears in writing. Same with différence, right? He changes the letter, a, instead of an e. And again, différence, différence. You won't hear the difference in speech, but in writing, the difference appears. So again, there's a, the speech has a kind of, you'd say, constitutive lack that writing is the supplement for. Writing becomes a supplement in order to complete speech. And he's saying this is the sort of, this is the matrix of Western thought, is this sort of ordering of being in this way with speech at the top and presence at the tippy top and then absence at the bottom. And what's the sign of absence all the way up until so sir? Writing is the sign of absence, written signs, because they indicate a, an absent speaker, and B, an absent object that's being referred to. And so all we really have when we're doing semiotics now or semiology after so sir is, the, is a sound pattern that's formal and memorized, I guess you could say, conditioned linguistic preconditioning and concepts that indicate absent things that are just in our mind. So when Anglophone speakers say difference and put the emphasis on that, on that changed letter, you're actually ruining Derrida's point by drawing attention to it <laughs> yeah. in speech. So you have to take the particularities right, so, of language into account when you're doing this stuff too. So I'm gonna I'm gonna have to duck out here, guys. But this was fun. Um, do you want me to just like record a quick goodbye and you can just pretend like I like you can change it or or, do, or does it matter? Like how do you want to do it? Uh, sure, just record a goodbye. <laughs> okay. See you, Victor. See ya. <laughs> See ya, Victor. Right. I don't know. I don't know. I just don't know. Or if you just like, I mean, I doubt I'll, yeah. Anyway, the prim- it's all good. Safe. The prim- Do you want us to clap so you know where I left? No, I'll see it. This is the primacy of speech over RK writing or <laughs> techno writing. Or writing paper. This is cool. Thanks for doing it earlier, too. This worked out well. So, yeah, I don't know. All right, later, Your guys. trace will remain with us. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Right. The ghost. Oh, guys, our Derrida jokes were so clever. I know, I know. So, well, so we could. There's so many. Like, I think if we're gonna continue this, we can pick maybe one term to focus on because there's like RK writing. We could talk about the Timpin. We could talk about the metaphor of light. Uh, we could talk about the army of uh, metaphors. The, the anyway, pharmacon. Matt, you oh pharmacon too. Matt, what are you saying? No, well, well, I just wanted to riff off of one thing that Eric said uh, before we move into discussing his so I would say esoteric terminology, right? Um, because this point uh, does actually have pretty serious political implications for a lot of people, right? Which is why he's had an impact in political uh, and legal theory and cultural theory beyond what you might expect from somebody who focuses on semiology, at least in his early text, right? Uh, so one example that I gave earlier on is uh, the way different post-colonial criti- critics have picked up his work, right? Uh, the other one that I really wanted to talk about, because I think it's actually more significant, uh, and it's actually more germane to a lot of the conflicts uh, around Derrida's work politically, uh, is the way feminists have interpreted his theories, right? Uh, because one of the things that they've pointed out, feminist Derridians, right, or at least sympathetic uh, feminist readers of Derrida, uh, is that one of the forms, uh, uh, one of the things that have been privileged in the history of Western metaphysics uh, has been a concept of masculinity over femininity, right? Uh, and the interesting thing is this is linked to a whole host uh, of different concepts uh, like reason, strength, uh, logocentrism, 
uh, and so on, uh, all of which are ascribed masculine qualities versus feminine qualities, which tend to be associated with things like chaos, emotion, uh, disorder, right, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and one of the things that like feminist Iridians like to do is showcase how uh, not only uh, are these different concepts actually interdependent on one another uh, in much the same way as what one considers uh, to be masculinity is highly dependent on usually this very negative uh, interpretation of what femininity happens to be. Uh, it's that once you deconstruct these, uh, you realize that our entire conception of what it means to be a man or a woman uh, is a lot looser and more problematic uh, than we thought, uh, and much more dependent on this con constipated vision uh, of history of the history of gender and its associated terms, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and this is why a lot of postmodern uh, feminists uh, have actually tended to problematize things like uh, the sex-gender division uh, in a way that earlier second-wave feminists wouldn't, right? Uh, since from Derrida's interpretation and the perspective of Derridian feminists, uh, they were still attached to this much more binary way uh, of looking at sexual difference. Yeah, we can yeah, talk you, about an example here quickly. Um, Kristeva. Yeah, is her go. name? Sure. Is it pronounced Yulia or Julia? I think she's Bulgarian. I'm we, not sure. We don't have Litvik here. Anyway, uh, the example that she gives, there's a, a phrase in Plato's Timaeus where he's also drawing this distinction between uh, something called a Cora. And the Cora is like a, an empty space between the forms, basically. So it's emptiness, which is exactly the opposite of presence in this uh, discussion. And it's also like the periphery as opposed to the center kind of thing too, isn't it? Right. It's an outside empty. So it's non-designated space. So uh, Kristeva reads this and goes... <laughs> Unmarked. And because it's unmarked, Plato considers it unimportant. Um, and then Kristeva's reading of this in Derridian fashion is like, this is exactly the place that woman concept woman has uh, compared to the man. The man she's the empty space. Um, and then goes into this entire discussion of Korah as this non-designated space, but connects it to like the recept the mother's womb um, and, and, draws out a whole rich history of why this this abject or not uh, that's the wrong term why this uh forgotten or non-designated space is considered not important but it actually is the space in which the forms appear so it's mm -hmm. er important yeah and and you could definitely use derrida's idea of deconstruction to look at those oppositions they kind of line up in a strange way because what you're talking about the we were saying like the center and the periphery, the uh, the the marked and the unmarked. So those tend to come in binaries, right? Like nature, culture, man, woman, like Western and non-Western. They tend to come in binaries. And one term is the marked term, and the other term is the unmarked term. One term is important, and the other term is completely considered unimportant. But what Derrida wants to show is that they secretly depend on each other in a way, right? Because all language is, taking over from Saussure, so all the language is is a system of differences. Everything is what it is because it's different from everything else. A dog is a dog because it's different from every other four-legged vertebrate, right? So a man and woman are, they're constituted by their difference, not by positively by what they are which is what like the biological kind of argument wants to do is say, no, there's actually an essential being of man and there's an essential being of woman. And Derrida wants to say, no, this is l language we're dealing with and this is a system of differences. And for so, sir, he wants to make all these limitations. Like when we're talking about language, we're really talking about speech and not writing. And we're talking about phonetic alphabets and not pre-Greek or ideographic alphabets. Like he critiques all of these sorts of exclusions again as reintroducing these Western metaphysical concepts because you reintroduce dependent binaries. But if you want to get behind the dependent binaries, you got to take this idea of difference to its like logical and almost absurd limits and to show that this is the system that we're dealing with. So when, you know, when we're doing speech act theory, for example, right? We get all these problems with, well, what about play acting? 
play acting is non-serious. He says, okay, okay, then, well, my system is going to exclude all non-serious statements are excluded from my system. And Derrida goes, aha, well, that exclusion right there, you putting one side of the binary into unmarked space, serious and non-serious, when you put one part of the binary into this unmarked space and say it's unimportant, let's get rid of it, Derrida wants to bring that back in and say, actually, this is the most important move you've made. And that's kind of, and he runs, and that's the basic sort of form of a deconstructive analysis, I guess you could say. Yeah, I, I think that's really well said. And I'll give an example that I was thinking about the other day, because uh, a student of mine is writing a paper on this. Um, but think about like the incel community or the MGTOW, uh, men go their own way movement uh, online. A lot of times they take this pseudo-essentialist approach to masculinity, right? Where they say being a man uh, is a really important thing and it's being denigrated today, we're being victimized um, and we don't need women, right? Uh, that's what the MGTOW movement is all about, right? Men go their own way, no more feminine women involved in our lives, right? Uh, but one of the things that you notice when you look at this discourse is the way that they describe masculinity is almost inherently negative, right? We are what women are not, right? Women are passionate and emotional, we are reasonable, right? Uh, women are weak, we are strong. Women uh, are driven by impulse, we're driven by logic, right? Uh, and Derrida's you know, gesture with there would probably be something to say, it would be to say, well, listen, right? You're absolutely dependent on what it is that you're trying to exclude, in some cases, almost rapidly so. And the more you try to demarcate yourself from what you're trying to exclude, the more you draw attention to the fact that you're only able to define yourself in opposition to something, right? Uh, now, that doesn't mean that we can ever get beyond this, but perhaps by recognizing this in a deconstructive manner, uh, we can play around with our conceptions uh, of all these different and ideas uh, in a more fluid and more emancipated manner, right? Uh, where we won't be constrained uh, by a binary that we're trying to overcome, uh, but that's inherently co-determinative, uh, as Eric might say, right? Yeah, but so the binaries proliferate, and we need to get around them. And one of the big like tragedies, I guess you could say, of that first essay in the 1960s when, when he kind of deconstructed structuralism was that like Levi Strauss never really got over it. He kind of disliked Derrida for sort of exposing the limits of his project in that way at something that was supposed to like inaugurate his his lordship over structuralism he never really got over it but the the kind of sad part is that Derrida quotes him constantly and uses his own insights and just sort of amplifies them in a way that that brings us this deconstructive movement, this this entry into post-structuralism actually comes right out of structuralism. So in a way, when people are looking at structuralism and post-structuralism, or in a cultural sense, modernism and postmodernism, there's a big argument to be made that they're actually continuous traditions. They're not, there's no solid separation between the two. Like what's the difference between like in cultural terms, a book like Ulysses and high modernism versus something you'd see today, right? They're all littered with pastiche and all of these postmodern things. But the, yeah, the sad part is that structuralism kind of had post-structuralism in it like a baby being born already. And Derrida just kind of reached in and pulled it out and said, here's, your, here's, here's what you've actually been trying to get to. And so when we get to this point, when we're thinking about like, okay, so we can't use binaries as a kind of essential oppositions that structure systems anymore. We get to this point where either we are nostalgic about it and we sort of mourn the loss of this sort of clarity. It's like in Rousseau, or we get to someone like Nietzsche, who's affirmative, who's the loss of objective truth now is something we have to embrace and something that's going to help us move forward. So you just end up at this point where people are either like mourning the loss, like a lot of what the a lot of what the modern critics of Derrida are doing, they're mourning the loss of objectivity, or you have people that just affirm it and embrace it in a Nietzschean sort of exuberance and they say, "Great, now I'm liberated from all of these oppressive concepts." And you know, Derrida brings us to this point in various ways and 
it's really hard to sort of conceptualize how to get past them. Because again, if we want to conceptualize getting past it, if we want to think about what's next, we still are, again, stuck in the terms that we've inherited from the same tradition that we're critiquing. Well, that's so why in a you way, do the, it's like that's why you do the play. The play is for that. Yeah, you it's just kind have of a Deleuzian. It's it's very, it's similar to Deleuze in that they're both, um, I guess, anti-Hegelian. And I know, like way back when we did Hegel, I said something like, "I can't ever read Hegel properly," like like Borna was asking us to, and the reason is because of Derrida and Deleuze, and now we're covering them. But they're so against totality and so getting against, uh, like getting stuck, and I think. The, the success of those kinds of uh, their their modes of thought is spoken to by the fact like Derrida is very much an enigma in that he there could be no Derrida today because no one's no one has a career like Heidegger does today. No one's going to spend enough time reading carefully, reading humbly, combing over every noun and the etymology of words in someone else's text. We don't have those er texts anymore. Because everyone's trying to, you know, advertise themselves and and quickly get quickly get books out and move from one thing to the next. So to be fair, both Heidegger and uh, Derrida were infamous for quickly putting books out, right? I mean, you pointed out that Derrida had three books a year, and he carried that pace on uh, up to the day he died, right? I mean, I think if you look at his bibliography on Wikipedia, which I glanced at, it was something like fifty books, and God only knows how many articles and media appearances from. 1967 on the way to 2004 when he passed away. But I think he only wrote like two books in the 70s. He released three all at once and then like, I guess, well, I, don't know, I don't know, I don't know. He's a very careful reader though. You cannot say that he's like putting out shit because every book that he no, writes no, say that. on these massive tomes um, are, ex they're, they're very slow, they're systematic. Sometimes you wish he would go faster because he says the same thing like, it takes him 30 pages to, to make a what could be a quick point. Um, so he's a little bit frustrating to read. But I wonder, do you guys agree with me in that suggestion that in our, basically because of what the text has become for us, uh, he's a little bit passe? Yeah, I mean, I, most people, I mentioned earlier on that I do think that there's still a kind of residual linguistic uh, idealism in Derrida, which is why I wouldn't characterize myself in Derridian in any sense. And I agree with the kind of Marxist, uh, Bajerian critiques of him in that respect. Just two terms, we don't need to get into that. But I will say that he has had a very positive impact on people who want to engage uh, in what we might call more totalizing or systematic kinds of philosophy, precisely uh, because he drew attention to the need to be respectful of difference uh, in a way that earlier philosophies of totality weren't, right? Uh, and you can see this actually in the impact uh, he's had on people who try to carry on with earlier modes of philosophizing, right? So there are still Marxists out there who will uh, talk about the same kind of things that Marx did. There are obviously still Hegelians out there who will talk about the same things that Hegel would. But you very rarely see them talk about the term totality or the absolute in an in unproblematic way, which you usually see are things like well, how Zizek will talk about uh, the absolute, right? Uh, where essentially... Um, it serves an ideological function in different systems of power. And so we need to get rid of it and recognize that the genius of dialectics is pointing out that nothing ever arises or arise at an absolute, right? Uh, the kind of tensions inherent within reality and the breaks within reality are constant features, not bugs that can be overcome and thought, right? Uh, and the same is true in you know, the Marxist tradition, where people will now talk about how it is that uh, we can't necessarily ascribe some kind of teleology to uh, history. Uh, because that implies that there's some kind of grand narrative reading that we can give in it. Uh, if we're going to carry on engaging in Marxism, we need to recognize that um, structures might be able, maybe analyzed in terms of contradictions, but we can't necessarily say that contradictions inherent within structures are going to lead to anything necessarily, right? And I think that's been a positive impact uh, on people who want to carry on doing the more traditional ways of philosophizing. Including myself, right, I should say, right? Because I, I prefer materialism to Derridianism, but I would always say that the, any kind of materialism you're going to do has to have post-Derridian characteristics. By the way, I would definitely, we can't have this conversation now, but I don't think you can say Derrida is not a material. You just added idealism to linguistic there and said that that's 
what he's doing. But I said residual linguistic idealism. And I would say the same thing about Heidegger, right? And I'm, that's not an original claim by me, right? People have pointed out how Heidegger's highly critical of Hegel uh, and Hegel's absolute idealism. But if you look at Heidegger's kind of history of the West, he sometimes says that the best way to interpret the whole history of Western civilization, as he understands it, uh, is through the story of its metaphysics and metaphysical epochs, right? So uh, to every epoch, there's a thinker who is appropriate to it. Uh, that's not Derrida. That's Heidegger. No, no, that's not Derrida. But I'd say that there's certainly still a residual element uh, of this way of reading the history uh, of civilization. And if you want to just call it this discourse, the discourse, uh, like civilization and its discourses, right? Uh, it's not as prominent as is in Heidegger, but there still is an element to it. But I don't really want to get into that. Because... Yeah, sorry. No, no, no. I mean, if you're reading Heidegger and Derrida the same, then no, you're reading one of them wrong. I don't really want to get into that. Yeah, we can't have this argument. Really far afield. Uh, I would into the Zizek's critique of Derrida and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, this isn't maybe. a critique, but I would think, like personally, I would just side with a project that looks more like Deleuze, because mm -hmm. contrary to what people think about Derrida, Derrida is extremely careful, and that's why he says, or that's why I, I reiterate, it's assumed that he's more linguistic than he probably actually thinks about the world. But he's saying, I'm going to stay textual. So I'm a writer. I read, I write, and I read, and that's what I talk about. I talk about books. I read books. Um, whereas I think a Deleuze project is a little bit more inspiring because yeah. it, it goes everywhere. It goes wherever you want. It goes schizo. What do you think, Eric? That's for sure. I think we can... We'll all become vegetable by the end of this. That's becoming sure. plant, yeah. becoming minor, becoming woman. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I still find structuralism to be like a very compelling tradition and I don't think yeah. it's, I don't think we're past it in a sense of like being post anything, just as I don't think postmodernism is fully past modernism. It's just a sort of new evolution. Like hyper? In, yeah, maybe, or, or it, it, there's a continuity there that. People oh, want to yeah. see a discontinuity between the two traditions, and I think there's a major continuity because, again, like I said, post-structuralism comes from within structuralism. Structuralism like laid the foundations, and in a sense, like some some writers have even made the strange claim that postmodernism actually came before modernism, or you look at Latour's claim, we have never been modern. So in a way, people want to take this like radically discontinuous view, but I I still so I still think like structuralism is very compelling and i don't think we're past it we're not post anything i think derrida just points out its limits very well and gets us to think a little bit harder about the binary terms that we're using like one of the biggest ones like self and other right like that's yeah. that's a huge one and i think if if you just sort of take that for granted in a structuralist sense as structuring subjectivity there's a self and there's an other then that's when you're falling back into idealism but i think i think derrida in a way helps us avoid that pitfall of thinking and writing and speaking and doing philosophy all right i think that's yeah. a good place to end thank you uh who was it again matt h for the suggestion well thank you all for your suggestions actually wayne aaron marissa bunch of people so we'll do this again i think we do have to do the debate that we've been talking about doing we'll, yeah we'll be get fun we'll get litvik in here to moderate for us and then <laughs> and then we can put matt on a time limit which is something i've been wanting to do forever so. <laughs> <laughs> we'll give sorry we'll matt. give litvik the power to mute the power to silence that's wise um, <laughs> Yeah. All right, wait, so are we done then? Uh, well, why don't we, I'll leave you with the final point since it just uh, backhand complimented you. Uh, okay, well, I have to say, like, um, I have an ambivalent relationship to Derrida, which I think he would probably appreciate in some senses, because primarily looking at things from a political standpoint, as I do, uh, given my own orientation, I think that this can be tremendously beneficial in loosening up old ideological or discursive expectations about how it is that the world operates and create more free spaces for people to interrogate expectations and conceptions of the world uh, that can become very calcified and rigid and serve to justify various oppressive systems of power. 
Uh, I do tend to agree with the sta fairly standard criticism of Derrida that has been made by everyone from Habermas going forward that it's hard to read any kind of positive program into this uh, about what can be done for the future. And so when people accuse him of being nihilistic, uh, I don't think that that's necessarily true, but I would say that he's certainly agnostic uh, about what we should do going forward. Uh, and particularly given the time period that we're in right now, I don't think agnosticism is good enough, right? Uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we should throw him away or that there's anything fundamentally problematic with his work. It just means that we need to commit ourselves to projects going forward in the expectation that they're not necessarily grounded in anything more foundational than better or worse interpretations of the world. Uh, and I think that's a very Derridian outlook, and it's what I think is the most interesting thing uh, about his work for political purposes. All right. Fair enough. I wholeheartedly endorse agnosticism because everything else makes me tired. <laughs> Fair enough. You know what I think would be my, if I could go to heaven and ask God for something, it would be that Dar or that Jordan Peterson would be stuck in a chair, clockwork orange style, and just have, just have Derrida read to him for 100 years. Yeah. What, what, what sort of music? What sort of music would be playing while his eyes are wedged open? <laughs> I don't know. What would he hate? Probably rap. Put on some trap music. <laughs> it, no, 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 it has it to be have something to be he like loves, that. so he so he can associate Derrida with it. That's the like the violent oh, see, pairing of the two stimuli. Oh, yeah, that's true. So yeah. it's got to be Derrida paired with I don't know. What is he like? Like Bach or something? I, some I Russian know. composer, Tchaikovsky. I don't know the screams of. The, the screams of snowflake liberals, I guess. I don't know. Just a just a, a track playing of people going, Wah! and then he has to read Derrida. Anyway, Jordan, we're glad you're back. We've missed you. He's back. He's back down the street again. So, <laughs> anyway, uh, thanks, patrons. We love you. And uh, yeah, thanks for the suggestions. We'll we'll. We'll look back to them and maybe I'll ask for a new one because I like the voting system because it takes the pressure off of us and then we get to talk about what we know people actually want to listen to. Yeah, I'm coming. Yeah, get yeah. the suggestions rolling. So uh, thank you guys. Uh, I'm going to hit the record button and I will talk to you guys. Oh, wait.